comment and uh, like she was bringing up, this is all going towards the launch of a new collective of experimental filmmakers in the Middle East. This is the first release of Fasha Palestine Collective. But maybe we'll take um, questions and then towards the end I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that. So, thank you. Anybody with some questions or thoughts? Could you take off that hat so we'll see you after the Sorry? There you go. <laughs> okay. It was a caution. A caution. I want to see your eyes. Show your okay. eyes. Okay, there was a question right back there. Yes. Hi. I was wondering how much art was part of your life before writing this film. Ah, visual. Ooh, no. Um, meaning visual arts? Yes. No, I um, I think, well, my, my, I come from a family of photographers. So photography, I was raised um, in a family of photographers, and my sister is sitting right next to you, she's an excellent photographer, so it did, it did come in the family. But um, I think that the approach to color and texture uh, and such really came more through things I learned in theatrical development and through um, strengthening the muscles of the imagination. I can't even draw. So, um, and I had never really studied visual artists in the way I had until this time. Some other questions, comments, feedback? What are you feeling? Okay, this is not your typical film. And your vision and the, and the actors, it's sort of, it is a challenge to um, let go of uh, a kind of narrative line. Um, so I'd like, I'd like you to just talk a little bit about how you, um, how you brought this project together in your own mind and then how you explained it to your actors and how your actors brought it to life. Sure, so I'll recap the question too for those who didn't hear. Um, saying that it's not a traditional linear feature and how did that non-linearity come together and how was it communicated to the actors and how did they interpret it? I think that's pretty much right. Um, I think there's many ways to answer that, but one thing I really feel is that it's become very difficult for me after living in the region to approach everyday life in the Middle East and what I was experiencing, what I see my friends experiencing, uh, with logical, rational concepts facts and ideas. Um, to me, it's become much more of a uh, subjective, sensitive, poetic, absurd, experimental uh, existence that defies logic and rational thought. So the nonlinear narrative, I think, came out of a desire to express something very, very particular to what I experienced, a synthesis of um, really conflicting experiences juxtaposed as they were in my life every day traveling from Tel Aviv to Ramallah and back and forth. Um, and so I think that the, the non-linearness of it as well for me helped explain the universality of the characters that I was trying to take us from being very rooted in one physical place on planet Earth to take us to a more a universal place in the human soul where it doesn't really matter which nationality or who's oppressing who. It becomes about a man and his demons and, um, and man and his art. So I think that that's one way to answer it and at the same time um, it was just about staying in the moment moment to moment watching how the creativity of the group unfolded. This kind of journey we all went on together. And how I explained it to them, I think we stood up and we worked on our feet. We didn't talk so much. We worked. We, we, we created imaginary situations and we explored things. Uh, and it wasn't very cerebral either, the way that I remember it. It was really imaginative and we were finding things in, in, in the collective unconscious together. But I don't know, maybe you guys can speak to how I presented that to you. I think I think it's true that there were lots of feelings involved in the creation, um, meaning we weren't detached of who uh, we are in day-to-day -day life and who we were growing up in this place. And this is part of the bank of of um, references for us, um, and, and was completely welcome to. 
to explore that. I think um, I can remember the workshops we did with uh, them um, that when invited us to go freely into uh, whatever um, is provoked from us and to bring it out, if it has relation to the film or not, or to the conflict or not. And of course, most of the life in Israel, Palestine, and uh, well, every conflictual place do not have a direct link to the conflict. Most of aspects of life have some link to the conflict. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, this, this, was, this was pretty much the way it was presented to us, like a, an opportunity to, to be all the artist and person we can be. Um, well, yeah, for me it was like a, a kind of a factory that you uh, put yourself in exam. It was like really open space that you, everything open and everything could be, so um, it, it was a different kind of a movement for me. So um, the sky was the limit, working and searching and, and bringing it. I remember myself like I didn't sleep, or the shoes, I couldn't really sleep, uh, of thinking to bring something really powerful, or to be uh, attached to this character, or to be a real uh, guy, a uh, real Khaled character. And uh, all the process was uh, Jessica and the guy and me uh, working and, and together, try to, to um, uh, to bring as much as, as, as uh, uh, from us to, to the character and to the uh, story. I, I think I can add that during the shoot, uh, the two months of uh, shooting in Nazareth, uh, for me it was the first time I've uh, lived in a Palestinian city. Uh, speaking nothing but Arabic all day, except English with Jessica, but the whole cast, the whole set, people, everything was uh, Palestinian cinema set. And all the emotions that that brought up in me were completely free to go into Eyal in his encounter with Khaled. Mm -hmm. and this intimate encounter, this intimate encounter of artists, accomplished or not, and then in real life, uh, a set of accomplished artists doing their trade, uh, but very, very much aware of um, of the complexity of this work together, all the time, every second, every day. There was a something that was linked and reminding us that we are sides of conflicts in spite of ourselves. Yeah, I just want to conclude by saying. So you mentioned the word challenge to let go and go with the film. And that's exactly what we want, or what my intention was, is to challenge people, what can you let go of in the experience of watching this film, in terms of your prejudices and what you bring to the moment, and also what can you let go of in order to move this situation forward, to end cycles of, of violence in, your, in yourself, in your family, and in these kinds of situations. So I like that you brought the word challenge. In the back? Very simple question. What was the point of the Iranian-American interlocutor? And what did she, I mean, she kind of Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of young women who have some sort of a relationship to the place, like myself, uh, ancestrally um, or politically, who find themselves witnessing these really intimate moments between Israelis and Palestinians and all of the humanity, humiliation, and perversity that you see. There's a lot of us over there. And so um, her character was just sort of this, um, the character of a witness of someone who happened to be in this place and to, um, to be 
in the physical space when everything was brought together. And I thought that her poetry, that one poem, uh, really in, in, in this American voice, really captured the outsider looking in and looking at this biblical place full of history and seeing it as just a sad situation. So her, her, her presence in the film was a bit of a tribute to that energy. And there's a director's cut of the film um, which at some point will make available as well, that has a journey, that shows her journey uh, through Israel and Palestine in which she goes on kind of a documentary adventure. So she, there's another aspect to the work in terms of that character. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if this movie has been shown in Palestine. Uh, we're premiering it here, okay. and soon it will go there. We did show it to the... Um, friends and families that made the film, and we had a really, really great response because we, we were able to make the film because people were excited about how new and unique it was. Uh, we weren't able to pay them what they were used to, we asked more of them, and everybody was involved because it was some kind of a new language. And so the people, the filmmakers that made the film have seen it and are really proud of it. Uh, and soon in the next months it will go and start its life over there as well, and as well as be available in Arabic um, on our website to download for the, all, all of the Arabic world soon, in the next weeks. Uh, I think the form is very powerful, the non-literal, the metaphoric, um, suggestive, and the imagery and, and the evocation. Leaving the form aside about the content, I have a question. Um, it's the gender feminist Room in the room question about um, why it's centered on women. A lot of Palestinian films are centered on men, and um, <clears throat> I'll say a little harshly, an outsider woman is not very interesting, so I wouldn't even want more of her. So why the centering on men? Um, I don't know. I'm a lot of women, and I feel like my presence is really present in the film as well as the, as the writer and as the kind of um, channel for this. So I think for me, I, I felt that and I think people feel that. Some people have a perspective that, that you know, felt that hand in it. Um, but it's very male dominant world. And to be quite honest with you, uh, coming out of the experience as a whole, I feel overwhelmed with how patriarchal and, and oppressively male the situation felt to me over And you're not re you don't think you're reproducing that? Um, well, um... I mean, the sense of whose narrative gets told, whose story, whose story do, well, do Palestinians themselves or do outsiders see and hear? So if it's, if it's a patriarchal society and most of the media is male, isn't this contributing to that? Um, I don't really know how to answer that question. I, yeah, I know. Um, from my point of view, from a uh, male character, male uh, actor point of view, and uh, Israeli, was, I've been to the army, and uh, the, um, the influence of, of male dominant, dominance in Israel and in uh, the Middle East in general is something I personally suffered from uh, a lot. Uh, growing up as an artist and uh, then being forced to go to the army. Um, I, I found a lot uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of feminine influence on the story guided by Jessica. And this is partly one of the reasons I agreed to participate in in a story that basically tells the story of security matters. Um, I always find that there are far more interesting subjects and important subjects to deal with than everything that goes under the military budget of Israel. With the torture and the investigators and the intelligence and the victims, etc. Which are generally men. And uh, the, the women's stories in Palestine, in Israel, and everywhere, are really waiting to be told. I agree that it's it's a real need. Um, at the same time, I think that the feminine side, if one could call it that way, um, of men, um, that many times I believe 
is the thing that allows men to be artists, to, to go beyond, to express feelings and to, well, to, to, to investigate their, their humanity through different um, tools that what, than what they've been given. Like me, as a growing up man in Israel, I've been given very sp specific tools to express myself, which are usually uh, tools of uh, establishment of, uh, yeah, establishment violence, the army, or the law, or or these places where I mean uh, I can go on for for hours about the inequality of women in Israel uh, towards women women in Israel, and 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 I feel that doing a movie that <coughs> deals with this these men. Because this whole problem of, of military um, um, control that is, is very, very felt in Israel, everywhere. If you could call it the gender problem to begin with. Um, the establishment of the state there has, always, there has only been one woman in power in Israel, ever. Um, and she, she used to be called the Iron Fist, and she, the Golda Meir, she was like, more men than men. Uh, and I think cinema, fiction cinema, in Israel, and I want to illustrate also the, to emphasize the importance on the, the intermediate person, which is Hali in, in the mm -hmm. movie, this woman we were, we were discussing. Um, there has always been, and there will always be, an intermediate role between Israelis and Palestinians um, because it's not only our story, it's a colonialist story. And um, it brings me to think about the role of <coughs> Jews in the Crusade Wars mm. between the empires of the Christians and the empires of the Muslims transferring everything pretty much. Yeah. I think we can go to a lot of places on this. I want to make sure we keep our answers a little succinct so we can get a lot of perspectives. But I to say, I want to make a movie about militarism. And militarism was, was presented to me as a very masculine monster to be tackled. So um, in this particular film, that felt okay to deal with these specific stories. Uh, I'm uh, very interested in your decisions with respect to the soundtrack, how you blended the different music, the English music, the Hebrew music, the Arabic music, but then you also included a Yiddish song. So, would you talk about your music choices? Sure. The, the film was actually written because I had a documentary, an hour-long documentary in front of me that I was about to make, and I thought to myself, I can't make another documentary. Um, I need to find another language to, to present these stories that I've been trusted with. And so what we did was we took this hour-long piece of material and we gave it to a, an amazing musical producer to me, Muscat, and we built a recording studio outside of Gaza, and we brought friends uh, from Idan, from Ramallah, from um, Tel Aviv, Oi Division, incredible, rebellious, Yiddish-speaking um, musicians, Russian singing, and we responded creatively to the ideas in the documentary for a week, making music. And then from that soundtrack, I wrote the narrative. So the um, relationship between the two main characters was really influenced by what Mohsen Supli laid down on his oud and what Itamar Ziegler laid down on his bass guitar. And there's many, many, many instances where the soundtrack really cuts through the layers of development, pre-production, post-production, and things that, ideas that came to me while we were making the soundtrack happen in the movie. Like, for example, when the, the, in one of the songs, the, vo the vocalist's voice crescendos singing about not wanting to go to war, and I imagine that these t kind of tears coming from heaven, and that's how the character of Jibril was born. So the character was re the music is really a character in the film, um, and the role of Yiddish was very much the Yiddish was the language of the Ashkenazi Jews before Zionism, and so including Yiddish and Russian uh, in the film felt really right as a. Uh, as is respect to the rich history of this people before this dark time. Um, and then I think you said something really nice in an earlier interview about daring to put these sounds together in a, in a way that I think defies the word fusion. For me it goes beyond fusion, but bringing kind of certain sounds together in a very, very gentle 
way to create something new was a great way to start the whole adventure of Mars at Sunrise through music. And I'm just very inspired as an artist through the images that I see when I hear music. I just want to add like, one brief comment. Um, among many, one um, unique uh, vision of this movie for me was how um, you presented um, two sides in a way that the oppressor is also oppressed. Right? And then another thing which is still related to this, even though by showing the, you know, the victim is not only the victim, also through that process, the oppressor is also victimized itself. Mm -hmm. But without justifying the actions of the oppressor, which is to me quite, you know, there's a very thin line there. If you cross that, then, you know, you might be just justifying the violence, the, the, the oppression, but without, you didn't do it. And to me, it's very important, and I really appreciate that uh, we start talking about the victim uh, but then we also show that the oppressor is itself a victim too, but by his or her own actions, nobody's creating that for him or her. So I really appreciate to see Thank that, because I've been researching about the whole issue of Palestinian Israeli, um, and it's very hard for me to come across such a vision in many um, specialist scholarship. Um, so yeah, I just want to I just want to say thank you for that. Thanks. I would say I think that that comes from many many years of being in the region and allowing time to get through the cliches and to get through the um, surface stereotypes to get to something deeper where you can cut that line. And I would say it was very much our intention, and we were always struggling with it. How do we approach these? How do we approach the relationship in a way that is very very clearly showing? who is it, what is happening in the oppression, at the same time honoring the deep humanity that's in every person. Because what are we doing if we're not honoring the humanity that's in the, in the instead of everyone? So I appreciate that you felt that. Do you guys want to speak a little bit about um, that thin line? How you felt maybe no. as, because I know we all, but in the work, we all at some point felt more comfortable and other moments we felt less comfortable. I mean, I can give you an example. We woke up Saturday morning one day and we were, um, very small crew because we couldn't afford to do overtime and I wake up my Palestinian crew and I have them watching Guy and Danya doing contact dance on a rooftop in Nazareth and they looked at me and said Majnuna, like what are we what movie are you making and why am I watching they just everything was kind of questioned and I said just trust me just trust me and there were moments with each of you where I had to ask for your trust and learn from your experiences in order to walk that line but that contact dancing is a real in way of looking at the relationships. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about how contact dancing, the form, what it gives in, in the acting process and the sure. story. Sure, I'd love to, to hear a little bit about whatever, either one, the line. Well, maybe. contact dancing, since it was the last thing uh, brought up, uh, maybe we'll go back to the one before. <clears throat> um, I think contact dancing provokes and helps us deal with uh, something much bigger than the simple touch between humans. Um, and I think in the, in the space of Israel-Palestine, touching and non-touching each other is, is a big, big issue uh, that we feel every day. And for me, um, in the character of Eyal with uh, Dania, um, which was a symbolic um, doctor, um, I think even she, for me, was, was not sure if she's real or if she's a part of, of my imaginary um, <coughs> process. And, and I think the healing of such a person, such as Eyal, uh, who basically, one can assume he came from a more from a more human background and then got into, really got into the job, and let the human, the human of him, behind, and then he threw Khaled. He went through to somewhere else, much more frightening and dark and and alone. 
and um, and, and needing of treatment, needing, knowing that his body holds needs some shaking. I remember I thought a lot about the word intifada when we were working with Daniel. The, the, the meaning of intifada is to, sh- is to shake up, unfold. And, and and Daniel was an expert in, in contact. I did contact several times, but he really shook me. And the word to shake is also something very, very much used in the Israeli Supreme Court when they're trying to limit, or not really trying, not really succeeding to limit the tortures. Uh, torture that does not mm. inflict traces on body is the shaking for days and weeks. Uh, they, they replace the investigator and keep shaking. The, the person eventually, little bones break from inside, mm. but it doesn't leave mm. traces. Um, so all of this, and shaking in a very rough way, brutal way there on the roof, I mean, you saw a few seconds, I can assure you, it was a few hours, um, really made me think about what, what Ayaz needs to throw up out of him. What is it that, and it can he? This movie reminds me so much of previous movies, but it's like in high definition and low flavor, like, you know, mature. Um, and I was about to ask you about the same question about the music and all the dance. And uh, because in previous movie you picked the artist because they were very few things or conscientious objectives. Uh, I want to ask how did you pick these artists, like all the painters, the dance and the music, and if you still capture that? Sure. Oh, how did they? Every single artist that came to touch this work came like divinely brought. Um, but to speak specifically, um, guy I had worked with through I had learned I had met him through my my documentary work and was inspired by his creativity as a writer before I knew he was an actor. Um, the uh, art director from. The film, not an incredible visual artist himself. I think that the film is full of his richness because this was the first time that the art director had the ability to go beyond just painting rooms in a house in, in Palestine. This was the first Palestinian film I can think of in which the, 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 the room to be decorated was the unconscious. So I think that the artists all came together because they wanted to explore the symbolisms and the textures. and um, uh, They're all friends. They're people who I live my life with there, most of them. Most everybody who contributed is, is a friend of one of ours. And people who, who I think struggle and triumph through the repression of expression and they, they managed to express and so that's how they came to us. Do you live in uh, Palestine and uh, work there? Uh, and was the film uh, finished here or there? Everywhere. Okay. I lived off and on in Palestine from 2004 to about 2012, 2011. I lived all over. I started in Jerusalem. I lived in Yaffa, I lived in Ramallah for a year, I lived um, at Lehem a few months, I lived in Nazareth for a long time, very long time, and we were based out of Nazareth. And the film was finished, uh, we did some months of, of uh, editing work there, with a really creative duo of um, artists, and then we decided that we had reached a limit in our narrative and we needed someone who didn't... Um, wasn't so familiar with the situation to help us go to the next level. Um, we went to Luis Caballar, who's a really very, very famous editor, uh, and he's Mexican. And he took one look at it and saw it in this really wonder. He solved all the problems overnight. Things that I would be going to people and saying, no, you like the dance scene. I mean, we will make this work, that checkpoint scene, where we'll make this work where nobody can do it, just okay, you can't do it. I gave it to him, he was like, done. Because he saw the drama in it. So then it went to Luis. Then it went to the sound design. It was also um, Martin Hernandez, who is Alejandro Gonzalez and Yaritu and Sean Penn. He's a very, very famous 
sound designer, he came in, it got more Mexican, uh, we <laughs> went to sound produce, um, we went to then do uh, the details, the sound mix in Mexico, the color correction in Mexico, because my GP is from Mexico, and also my family is from Guatemala, so it makes, there's some, it made some sense. So it went from being something that was entrenched in the physical location of Palestine, and it was super Palestine, everything, to being Mexican. <laughs> the transformation and the transportation did your, did your film a lot of good. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds beautiful. It's nice to hear that. And I just have to say, this is the first time that we've sat together in front of an audience. So hearing you say it's beautiful feels wonderful to me because it, I, I, want, I want for these, I've had the opportunity to present it and have many reactions. I want for these two gentlemen to hear that. He's a sound designer. I so. Oh, I, you have to come I, to the quad I, and hear I, I the 5.1. <laughs> These two we'll have that next year. are amazing. These two are amazing. Are totally yeah. amazing. Thank you. Your yeah. Well, of course you're amazing for coming up with this and guiding them and all that. <laughs> they're the ones. They're the that ones. We see. Yes. And that's they're they're the ones that we uh, react to, interact with. And uh, I, I think, I think, uh, what is the, uh, what's happening with the film? Yeah, so the film will be this week at the Quad Cinema. Right. 5.1, Dolby, DCP, <laughs> really beautiful, looks gorgeous. Um, and uh, it will be playing for a week. Please, if you enjoy the film, tell everybody, because this is a very grassroots initiative. It's us, and uh, we could use your support. And then a, a week after that, on marsatsunrise.com, as well as on the uh, website of several of our distribution partners, you'll be able to download the film in Arabic, in Hebrew, in Spanish, and in English, uh, and watch the film home, buy or rent, um, and then we can plan to continue screening. We're going to be at the Chicago Palestine Film Festival, we have screenings planned in Toronto, there's one happening in Germany, and we're really embracing this new model of of cinema distribution where you can find a film in theaters, mm -hmm. in festivals, and online all at the same time. And for a film that's as unique and, and um, ambitious as this one, our audience is endless. So we're going to slowly start to let the film go. And at the same time, try and provide opportunities for people who want to see a DCP, a digital cinema package, and really great sound in a theater to still be able to see it. And I think it's the kind of film that you can watch at home, like, and then go see at the theater and see something different. So I'm really excited about this approach. And then um, the, the really exciting part is that we're going to take the proceeds from this project and we're starting a collective of experimental filmmakers from the Middle East called Fashion Palestine. And this year we'll be looking to add three new members. It's myself, my friend Dima, and a man who is the sister of a really well-known um, Palestinian director, Shireen Davis. And she's herself a fire dancing video artist. She's a phenomenon. Myself, her, and um, Arab and uh, Tarzan, this incredibly genius filmmaking duo from Gaza, who we hope to screen their work to, along with Mars Sunrise, who's completely fell in love with each other creatively. And we're going to look for three other members uh, this year focusing on Palestinian work. And then as the years go, we're going to attempt, it's very ambitious, we need a lot of support. To really spread it, we're going to attempt to create a structure that can hold the place for films that ask you to let go of a traditional narrative like this one does. Because we feel absurdist and experimental, absurdist, uh, humorous, nonsensical responses to reality in the Middle East are valid. And <laughs> we should, so it's the kind of art we want to see. So that's what's happening with Mars and Sunrise. All right. Answer the question. Is there something we haven't heard from? Who would like to ask a question, and then I'll get back to you in the first. Um, I, I, you two are very, I guess, politically apathetic people. Like not, like both don't seem to have particularly passionate opinions about one side or the other. So, just so could you speak up just a little bit? I can't. Sorry. Um, 
I was just wondering, um, considering that the two characters seem politically apathetic, like what what was what, what inspired the the idea that the connect with thread would be the arts? Oh, I don't find them to be politically apathetic at all. No. I think, which is interesting, and it's valid. You know, the mood is a poem; you can read it any way. Um, but you know, on one hand, I think we have one man who has given up his heart and soul and his creative life for the politics of a government and a state. Yeah. Very political statement to me. And Khalid's every move is resistant and defiant. <coughs> and I don't think he's, he's not affiliated with any political movement because mo uh, a lot of the most creative Palestinians I know and we know don't Israelis. fit in those, and Israelis just don't fit into the boxes of what's presented as a political opportunity. So I'll pass that to you guys, but I didn't particularly think of them as politically apathetic. I see them as the opposite. I think that might be the wrong choice of words, but just not. No, it's not. It's valid. Um, I guess local politics. They are. I think breaking someone's hand. It's, I think they're very. Maybe their actions are very political, and that's how their politics are expressed in the film is through their actions and their behavior, more than voice. Would you guys say that's true? Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, it's like the situation that we live. It's it's like you don't choose to be political. You live this situation, and you find yourself really. Uh, in the center of the political. Uh, Khaled's situation, he really like pieces of, of, of all the Palestinian uh, uh, like from Gaza and West Bank and uh, 48 and the uh, refugee around the world. It's, it's, you can find it in, in, in one character. This is the struggle itself. And this is the, the, the political. It's full of political. Even though that he's an artist and he believes in art, and uh, yeah, there's a part when Khaled says in the movie uh, yeah, about that the the IDs. No, no, when 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 he speaks about uh, what the interrogators claimed he is, uh, they they suspect he's Hamas or communist. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and that 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 shows that shows a lot of the reality in both political realities of Palestine and Israel is that many people can't really fit into to any of these boxes anymore. Um, and uh, I mean, there's one thing written on the wall, um, existence is resistance. Mm -hmm. and, and just like Ali says, I mean, it's a day-to-day -day thing and I think, um, well, this non-political issue <coughs> we all have like you know parts of oh they're speaking politics again let's go to the kitchen or not listen to that 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 exists everywhere right so in Israel and Palestine it's much stronger but then again when you say I don't speak about politics this something else is a political choice mm -hmm. this, this is what happened to me like I try to really not to talk about politics but I find myself in the front <laughs> really can you remind us of the last uh, see, invent, like, you know, um, you and you writing things on the wall. I think that's kind of summarized the whole thing. I mean, what is this love you speak of? Exactly. I mean, I think that's, you know, that is itself political, but yes. I think on a different way. Yes. yes. I think we're trying to elaborate what political means. Yes, and that's why the focus on the arts, because the arts can do that. Oh. I want to ask a, a, a difficult question for me to ask. But it has to do with privilege, and um, the, um, and how do you? I mean, I, I I really find the film and the discussion really um, very helping me understand the film. Thought the gender question was a very important question. Thought your response with all of you was a very was a good response. Um, but privilege, here you are in someone else's place, telling a story and trying to reach out to say what the common. Uh, universal uh, theme is here, a lot of it around masculinity and about militarism uh, without it being that kind of film. I think in the past a very different storytelling 
but the same kind of looking at, trying to, trying to tell something in a new way. So talk, each of you, about you have, you have privilege. You have privilege just being in that space and doing these kinds of things, and how you balance that out with your creativity. I just think it's about ownership. I have, a, I have an American passport. I have an incredible amount of privilege. Um, I am a Jew of Arab descent. I have the privilege that I can stand in either community and feel grounded in my feet, in my center. That's a privilege. Um, I think that uh, I was very aware of my privilege and took a good long time to educate myself politically so that I could dare step to these great artists and, um, and humble my, I tried to humble myself and, and see myself with, as, as, as something insignificant within a larger picture and yet honor the very specific things that I experienced that I think were worth sharing. Um, like you said, it's not just your story. My privilege, and we're paying for this nonsense. So privilege, responsibility, they're really big terms, but I do think that, you know, people always ask me about the difficulties of shooting in Palestine and occupation, and yeah, there's ways to answer that. But in the reality, it was very easy for me. Mm. It was very easy for me. Um, but how would you guys respond to that? Yeah. Well, I'd like to say that there are many, many, many productions coming to Israel and Palestine. And many of them just come, many, 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 they come, they do, they go. <laughs> and people work on that, that, that nourishes the, the industry. We're waiting for these foreign productions to give us uh, the rent. And Jessica stayed for a long time. That really changes a lot in the dialogue and the trilogue of these sides. Um, yeah, I think basically it wasn't just a movie, it was like a project of a life. Community project? Yeah, it's a community project. Yeah, and thank you for coming with me. Mm -hmm. Someone else we haven't heard from? Thank you so much. <laughs>